guttural voice coming out of this 15-year-old girl. And the entire time she was trying to kill everyone in the room, it was laughing. They were like, look, don't even contact these things. And there were many times when I cried myself and said, don't open that door. What's going to come through? It's like a serial killer. It, it doesn't care. It has its own morality or lack thereof. And it will manipulate any way it possibly can. And the conclusions that I've come to in the last few years, they are very disturbing. Carve the name of an unclean spirit in them and implant that into the body. In tonight's episode, we get deep. My guest tonight is no stranger to dealing with the darkness. Nathaniel Gillis is a demonologist who's dealt with some frightening cases of the supernatural and the unexplained. The stories and information he's going to share with you in tonight's interview will blow you away. Nathaniel, take it away. Well, my name is Nathaniel Gillis, and I'm known as a demonologist. And so uh, my very first encounter with the phenomenon occurred when I was eight years old. My parents had moved into a new house, and when we actually toured the house prior to moving in, I witnessed uh, a full-bodied apparition. Once we moved into the house, the entity, I like to tell people the entity mutated, because that's really what it did. When it first manifested, it was in the image of a little girl that I, I really thought that she belonged to a family down the street, or maybe she had snuck in, you know, hiding hiding from the realtor or something. But turns out, no, she, she absolutely didn't belong in the house. She didn't live on the street or anywhere near the house. But once we moved in, that entity mutated. It evolved in its pathology and manifestation. And so I never saw the little girl again. However, I did begin to see full-bodied apparitions, uh, of different different entities or different images, including uh, just voices. That one night I, I woke up in the middle of the night and I heard this conversation going on above my head. Strangest thing to this day, the strangest thing I've ever experienced. And what was so weird about that was I could I, I could hear them enough to know they're talking to each other, right? But I could not hear them enough to understand what they were saying. Very very strange stuff. But there was also this 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 thick presence in that house. And I, I could still, like, whenever I talk about it, I'm back in that room playing my video games. I could just feel it, you know, vibrating and just in the room. It was very, very weird. Um, so, yeah, the, there, was a, there was a lot of experiences that I had in that house. And one of which I'll never forget was I was playing a video game. And you know how it is. It's nighttime. You have the, the screens in front of you. You know how it is when you look away, you see, like, from a light source, your eyes have to adjust to the darkness, and only then do you realize what you're looking at. Up until then, it's just flashes and all that stuff. That's what happened to me. I turned this way, and I look, and as my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I saw this featureless shadow figure just staring at me through the window. And once he, it, I, should, I was going to say, yeah, I don't know what it was. It, when it, once it realized that I was watching him, it just kind of tilted its head like that. And so that's when I just, I was distraught. I ran into my parents' room freaking out, like, you got to get me out of this house. This is nuts. Um, you know, it's, what's, so, what's so interesting to me about this particular case study of mine is, like I said, it evolved. It, it began as a little girl and then evolved into like a smoky apparition that would kind of float its way into the room at nighttime and ball up into a dark cloud in the corner of the room. But then it began to give me nightmares and it was like, it was a looping nightmare. It was the same nightmare. Like it would start and end and I'd go right back into it from the beginning. And it was always in black and white. And the nightmare consisted of me walking up to a shelter at a park where they have like family reunions and birthday parties. And I saw two young men sitting on a picnic table the, the, the young man on the right, first of all, they both had their backs turned towards me. The, the man on the right, the young man on the right, had a needle in his arm. And the other young man was just sitting there with his back turned towards me. But I tell people, you have to understand, I was very innocent. I didn't even know what marijuana was. I didn't even know what insulin was or sugar diabetes. So I had no frame of reference for what I was witnessing in that nightmare. 
But as I was walking towards them, the young man on the left turns around, makes eye contact with me, and he gives me this really creepy grin. That's when he pulls out a black 357 Magnum, puts it in his mouth, and pulls the trigger instantly. I'm awake, and now there is an entity in the room. It was thick. You could feel it. You could smell it. And the only way I could describe it was it was like feeding on my fear. And one of the coping mechanisms that I had to learn, and I really did, I developed it as a young guy, got a little tyke, as they say, a little tyke, eight-year-old kid, was I realized that at a certain point, this being was fabricating terror in me. Like, he, it would do things in order to incite fear. And, and it really felt like it was inciting that emotion just to feed off of it. And that's what is really instrumental in, in getting me into the field I'm in and, and trying to understand some of the darker nuances of the phenomenon we're all researching. But uh, th those are some of my experiences. Well, once I started getting into the field, I, I had various experiences that ranged from just hearing EVPs to hearing what's called DVP, direct voice phenomena, uh, to actually confronting entities. Um, there was one case I had where it was a murderer took place in the home, and I, I, I didn't know that. I had, I had no idea. But what happened was the family had reached out to me because they thought they were reaching out to my father, who was a pastor. And so uh, the email was essentially, hey, Pastor Gillis, we would like you to come in and pray for our family. We've suffered a violent tragedy. And uh, so when they reached out to me, I, I told my dad about it. So I reached out back to them. I said, okay, you know, my father and I will come and pray for you and the family, and I said, you know, what exactly is going on? And they said, we have been experiencing a profound amount of violent paranormal activity. And when that, those, that buzzword came out, my father was like, that's you and the family. You know, you do that, that that's, your, that's your thing. It's like, okay. So once I get to the house, I walk in and I meet an atheist. And <laughs> the first thing out of his mouth, hi, mate. I don't believe in you, what you do. I don't believe in the supernatural. I don't believe in any of this junk. I think you're out of your mind. The only reason I'm here today is because my best friend is inside and it's his house. I'm like, oh my God, it's going to get good, right? Because you, you're getting confronted at the house. It's, it's, something's going to happen. I was like, oh no. So I walk in and, you know, I looked around and I met some of the family members and I asked them what they had been experiencing. And I still, for some reason... Number one, I wasn't reading the local papers. I uh, wasn't on social media looking at all the news. I was working full time at the time, and I just I didn't have time for it, so I didn't know exactly what happened. So when I'm talking to the family, I notice that there is a portion of the carpet cut out in the corner of the living room, right in front of the door. So I'm talking to them back and forth and everything, and I, I do my investigation. And then at the very end of the best investigation, I had them come to the living room, back in the living room. And I asked them, okay, okay what, what's going on here? Like, you know, I, I picked up some different EVPs and stuff. What exactly have you been experiencing? And the father told his story. He said, a few months back, my daughter, who was approximately 13 years old, became good friends with a 15-year-old from school. I saw I thought, okay, that's not a huge deal, but all right. And he goes, no, he goes, they became very close. And he said, whenever my daughter would bring this friend around the family, we would get this weird vibe. There was just this darkness about her. And whenever she would leave, we would always talk about it as a family. And finally, we were like, listen, honey, we don't want you to hang out with her. There's something wrong with that girl. And he said, you know, about three or four months go by, and he's like, we could not get our daughter to obey us. You know, you can do whatever you just don't hang. You see her at school, that's fine. Don't text her, don't call her. Because once she start, once she entered into that girl's life, that's when the paranormal activity began to manifest in her home. And so he said, one night, we're, uh, he said, my daughter was asleep. My wife and I were both worked second shift, and he's like, so we're, we're sitting down, we're watching television, I'm drinking a beer, catching up on, on life and our days. And he said, I look out the window, in there is that 15-year-old girl 
staring at my wife and I. And he said, Nathaniel, he said, I didn't know what to think, first of all. It's not a man. It's a girl. Why am I freaking out? I mean, it's weird. It is weird. He said, but, I, you know, he's like, it's a 50-year-old girl. He said, I, I called the cops. I said, you know what? I don't, I'm, you know, she's kind of strange. I don't know what's going on. But she's looking at us at a really weird time in the morning. And so the police got there. She was already, already disappeared. She's gone. He said, we, we didn't see her for another few months. And he said, but during this time period, our daughter kept getting further and further away from us. And he said, the further she got from the family, you know, that the, the manifestation, the paranormal activity would go through the roof. And so to list some of the things they experienced, uh, shadow figures, orbs, door handles shaking, something that was walking on the wooden floors and creaking them at nighttime. And he said it just every day was just something different. And there was just this malevolent presence that, that just soaked the house. It would overshadow the house. You'd feel it when you wake up, you'd, you'd go to bed with it. And he said, we, we went to a local church. We talked to the minister about it and everything. And he gave us some advice. He said, but we really didn't know what to do. We're trying to, to rehabilitate our daughter, trying to get closer to her. Meanwhile, there seems to be some invasive species just trying to hurt us or, or, or I don't know, give us nightmares. He, what, he did not know what to do. So one night, he said there again, they were back, back on the couch after work, relaxing. And the daughter goes to the door. So she opens the front door. And before her parents could even realize what is happening, in walks the 15-year-old. pair of stub nose scissors in one hand and a knife in the other. By the time they, they realized what was going on, the, the, the father told me to my face, out of his own mouth, he said, Nathaniel, there was a male guttural voice coming out of this 15-year-old girl. He said it was deeper than my voice. And the entire time she was trying to kill everyone in the room, it was laughing, calling us names and mocking us. And that is why the carpet was cut up. The police had just finished up their investigation. So I did my cleansing. And when I was done with it, it was almost like, you know how you have those um, light switches that are, you just slowly raise them up. Not just instantly, but raise them up. That was exactly what it was like. I mean, you could literally see shadows moving on the wall and disappearing. After that, after that cleansing, they, they never had any paranormal activity again. To this day, I'm very good friends with the, uh, the father's sister. But a few months after that, I'm in a restaurant. Same restaurant I was in when I got the original email to go to help them. I, I'm chilling. It's like 7 o'clock. And I'm in the same chair I was in the last time when they emailed me. And uh, I'm just sitting there reading. I'm, I always have a book. I'm always reading. And this couple sits down next to me. And this the, the wife is keep poke, she keeps poking her head around her husband. I'm like, oh, God, what's going on? What's going on now? And I was reading a, a, a book on which are literature by Ariel Masters. And so she was, it piqued her curiosity. So I'm like, okay, in about five or six seconds, she's going to switch chairs. And I'm going to have to act, act, I'm going to act like I'm not a demon. I'm going to tell them I'm a plumber or I'm a teacher or something. Because, you know, once you get in those conversations, oh, my God, either they like it or not. And when they don't like it, it's like, okay, see ya. So I didn't know what to say. I was like, yeah, I'm reading this. Uh, what's going to happen? So anyways, uh, we get to talking. And she goes, you know, like, have you had any cases lately? I said, yeah, my last case. And I didn't go into too much detail, honestly. No names or anything. But I gave her just a little bit of an idea of what occurred. She said, you're Nathaniel Gillis. I said, am I? I hope not. <laughs> I guess I am. She says, no, you're Nathaniel Gillis. I said, okay. I said, how would you know that? She says, well, I can't tell you. I said, you're going to. You just ordered food. So I got another 30 minutes. I'm going to work on you. You're going to tell me how you know, okay? <laughs> you know, obviously, you know, at that point, though, I'm like, wait a minute. Like, how would you know that? And so about 45 minutes later, 
uh, we really get down into to my research and just talking about different subjects. She said, Nathaniel, I'm the social worker that is in charge of both minors. She said, I was a social worker that the family wanted you to meet with in order to help these, these girls. She said, the night you did a cleansing, or the cleansing rather, she said, I received a phone call from the jail. And the 13-year-old girl said that the entity that had been visiting her in her house for the last few months walked in and said, I no longer have authority over you. And it left. Now, strange, very strange. That, that's the very first time that, that story has taken place in my career. Uh, you know, an entity saying that's very weird. Um, but what was so interesting about that case study was the data that I collected suggested that the entity was actually a disincarnate being. It was actually a relative of hers. And that's when my perception of the phenomenon began to stretch outside of the evangelical blueprint I inherited growing up. And so that was very influential and instrumental in getting me in to, to what I'm doing now. What, what, are, what are we looking at? You know what I mean? There's different models of demonology. There's different models of entities. But what does the data say? Not the dogma. And that's really what I've been stressing here lately when I do lectures. Not the dogma. This is what I believe. Okay, but what does the data say? Well, so here, here's the problem that I grew up having, especially when I was living in that haunted house. You're experiencing these, these various phenomena, trying to understand what it is. Why is it targeting me and not the rest of my family? Why is it that, you know, I could wake up in the middle of the night, like I said before, and I could hear people talking, but nobody else around me heard a thing. And so as an eight-year-old kid who played Donkey Kong, I was faced with the reality, uh, number one, I'm failing grades in school. Number two, they're, they're making me feel like I'm crazy, and I don't want to be crazy. You know, I, I want to go play with my friends, ride my bike, have sleepovers, and watch Nick at night. And yet what was occurring to me was traumatic. I'm talking about going to bed at nighttime in this pervasive stench just enveloping the room. It, it smelled like sulfur. It smelled, I've never smelled a corpse, but a lot of demonologists compare it to a corpse. It would just kind of, it would enter my room and along with the stench, you could feel this immense pressure just moving in. And there were many times when I cried myself to say, I'm not trying to, you know, get people to pity me. I'm just trying to tell my story. <laughs> I don't want people like, oh my God, man, you went through it. But it was really traumatic. And uh, there were times when it felt like I could not get rid of it. I, I can remember, I guess I do have some more paranormal stories. I mean, you're getting it out of me now. Um, I, remember, I remember going on a uh, sleepover with a bunch of kids from school, my friends. And, you know, everybody has their own room. They all have their own cots, their own, you know, sleeping bags. Well, I'm laying in my, my buddy's bed. He's sleeping in his mother's bed. And we're like nine. And it's at midnight, around midnight. And you can't hear a thing in the house. Not a thing. Maybe somebody snoring, maybe. And next thing I know, I hear someone walking up the wooden stairs. And I'm thinking... I'm looking at Jacob, which is my friend, right across the hallway. I know it's not him. I know it's not my buddy laying down on the floor. I know it's not my friend's mother. There is something that is walking up the stairs. It freaks me out. Uh, and I could still remember hearing it and getting triggered because the same presence that I felt at the house, the house I was living in, I felt it again in that house, my friend's place. You could, it, it was weird because it followed me. Like, it would not let me go. I would go to school, and even when I was like, they put me in like a little Christian school, you know, like a church school. And they're trying to pray and everything. I'm like, man, you guys need to pray for me because I'm going through stuff right here. And I was failing grades, left and right, left and right. My parents were talking to the teachers. The teachers, we don't understand what's going on. Uh, I would go to school and I would pass out. I didn't want to do work. And because what was occurring to me is I was staying up all night. 
I was afraid to go to sleep because whenever I would go to sleep, that, that entity would manifest in my dreams and I didn't want it to experience that anymore. And so that was, like I said, it was instrumental in, in driving me to want to understand this phenomenon. Number one, I didn't want to be alone, and, and thankfully I wasn't. There are millions of people all across the world who've experienced this, this same manifestation. And so that, that's really what, what drove me head on, not just to understand it, but how can we help people? How can we, how can we deal with the phenomenon? I don't, I don't want to do a coping mechanism. I want to give people answers, not just to understand it, but how can we stop it? And that's where I've been now for the last three years. And what I found out is very disturbing, very disturbing. Here's the thing that I learned was that the blueprint I grew up with was not fitting at all. They're all horns and hooves. They're demons. They're fallen angels. They want to kill you, maim you, and, and eat your, take your lunch money and eat your breakfast. They, they want to do all kinds of stuff. And so whenever I would experience a malevolent presence or a manifestation, I would go to my local church. I'd give them everything, and I'd be like, okay, what do I do with this? And over and over again, if it wasn't my youth pastor, it was my pastor. If it wasn't my pastor, it was my Sunday school teacher. They were not prepared to, to first of all, understand what I was going through or even facilitate the questions I was asking. In other words, the phenomenon had eclipsed their blueprint of reality. And the way dogmatism works is if it doesn't, if it doesn't fit the blueprint, it doesn't exist. You're crazy. You know, you're lying or you're, you're just making it something that it, it would, was never. Yeah, it never was. And that it certainly was not the case. I, I didn't want to go through any of that. You know what I mean? I didn't want to be alienated from my family and suffer that way. But that was the first time when I realized that there are certain questions that we have to ask ourselves about the phenomenon. If they are all horns and hooves, then why do they have their own belief systems? Why is it that certain demons cannot read? Others have PhDs in literacy and in historical documents. It never made sense to me. And I think that is why, that, that at least for me and my research, that's why I was forced, in a sense, to, to abandon the dogma and embrace the data because the only way we're going to get accurate with, with what we're experiencing, with what we're documenting and what our ancestors documented, the only way we're going to get any accuracy regarding that is if we're honest with it. The honesty is important and imperative because what's occurring right now in the field is we have a lot of shows out there on TV that are propagating lies and people like me, as an eight-year-old watching that, I'm thinking, okay, I'll do that. And it never works. And so that's when I started realizing, okay, in order to, to embrace this and learn more about it, I have to get into the literature. I have to go out there and at the very least encounter the phenomenon to learn about it, document it, and understand the nuances of it. Do, do they have belief systems? Do they have a certain victimology? Do they have a pathology? Why is it? That, that some of these cases, the entities will only arrive at a certain time of the month. And then they'll leave, and then you won't see them for another year. But when that day comes back again, they'll show up and they'll do the exact same things. And so from between the ages of about 15 to 35, I poured myself into witch era literature, demonology, any, anything I could get my hands on, uh, biblical antiquity, Mesopotamian texts, ritual bowls, and I spent a lot of money on it, but I invested myself in order to understand what's going on. And the conclusions that I've come to in the last few years, they are very disturbing because we don't know what they are. We, don't, we, we cannot harness them. We cannot control them. They have the ability to literally, their access to knowledge, they know when we'll die. They, they can manifest as someone they have, and I'll get the case studies here in a little bit. They can manifest as someone that you know and that you would trust in, and that's for a purpose. They want to manipulate you for their own agenda. And that, that this whole idea of, of what they are, and it's, it's evolving but it does appear to be, and this is my research, at least for me, a singular intelligence that has its own agendas 
One of them, obviously, the hybridization program, but it evolves according to our awareness of it. All right. To my colleagues and I, it does appear to be a singular intelligence that has masked itself throughout history. The reason it masks itself is because it's trying to diversify its image. If it can diversify its image, then we as researchers and experiencers, we feed into the propaganda of compartmentalizing. <laughs> Man, don't do that. I'm getting pumped. <laughs> yeah, compartmentalizing the phenomenon to the degree that it can remain elusive and still maintain the agenda that it's after. This is what, this is, this is, if anybody that has a cursory knowledge of the literature and case studies, it's impossible not to come to that conclusion. So that's what I started getting into demonology. I'm thinking, okay, are these really demons? And if they are, do they, what, what blueprint are they a part of? Are they Christian demons? Are they Catholic demons? Are they Jew? You know, it, it, so I was kind of in that world. And that's when I realized after a certain amount of books I've read, I read the same sentence over and over again. There was one sentence I read in a book uh, about the phenomenon. I read it 50 times because it never made sense until I realized that, okay, it's propaganda. The phenomenon is manifesting a mask because it wants to hide from us. Now, this gets back to the idea, are they a threat to us as a species? Well, when people ask that question, they don't realize the question they're asking. What they're really asking is if they are a threat, then why aren't they killing us off like cattle? Why aren't they going in and murdering everybody? You know, they're giving everybody cancer or going in and abducting everybody and, and leaving nothing but an empty earth. Well, the problem with that, that model is that it's not parasitic. The data that we've collected, <laughs> it's not even suggestive. It is parasitic. It has the ability to latch on to people and to use people as hosts. And if, in fact, the intelligence is parasitic in nature, it is after survival. And the way it survives is by self-replicating. And the way it's self-replicating, that's why it's not annihilating us. It needs us. It's like a parasite with a host. It's like a software with hardware. But moving forward, I, I realized that, that if we allow the phenomenon to employ propaganda against us, then we feed into the belief system that experiencers in ufology and victims of incubi encounters are different. They're categorically opposite. And so what's happened, especially here in the States, is we'll go to conferences and you'll have different panels or, or different lectures going on. And you'll have, I'm just going to use the name, you'll have Deborah over here saying, okay, I was abducted by an alien and it appeared to me in the image of someone I had been intimate with in the past. And, and she'll give her whole lecture because it's ufology, it's abduction phenomenon. Meanwhile, 20 feet away in another room, here is Sarah. Guess what Sarah is saying? Yes, and I was taken by a demon. And this demon manifested as someone that I was intimate with. What? And what's happened is, is we've allowed and played into the hand of the propaganda by, by separating these, these victims and these experiencers. And what my colleagues and I are trying to do, especially here in, in February, is say, okay, if they're separate intelligences, why are they employing the same pathologies? Why are they employing the same rituals in magic rites? We'll get there in a little bit. What's really going on here? And is it a byproduct of, of cultural positioning and, and influence? Some of it. But more than that, the phenomenon is influencing us. It wants us to separate all of these victim victimologies, all of these experiencers. Because it's afraid that if one day we get, we get these women in one room, we get these experiences in one room, they will begin to rip the mask off of it. 
And you'll see for the first time probably in history that this is a malevolent presence in that it has not changed its pathology. It has just changed what, what it allows itself to be called. Yes, yeah, so th th this is really where we're at in the field because the question is asked, if it is benevolent, why such a, a mass of a profound amount of, of deception involved? I, I can remember early on in my career, I was doing research, uh, biblical antiquity text that, from text from biblical antiquity, ritual bowls, uh, various manuscripts, and, and you know, and all of them were paranormal in nature. I was really looking for, okay, I, I'm tired of limiting my my research to names. Well, this demon, his name's Kyle. Okay, sure. Oh, well, this demon's name's Beelzebub. Okay, you know, sure. One, when I realized that after reading so many books and having cases, what I realized was, yeah, this is not, this is this junk. <laughs> it's the phenomenon hiding from us. And so that's when I made it a conscious decision that really propelled my research to a new level. I decided to ignore what they want us to call them. I decided to, to throw away all the little descriptions because a lot of times, all the time, they provide no definition. And that's, so I evolved, I had to. And uh, thankfully I did, because I'd be still groping in the darkness. But what I learned was something, it's troubling, but I needed to learn. Number one, there is an intelligence that evolves according to our awareness of it. I need to say that again. <laughs> it evolves according to our awareness of it. In other words, there are seasons in time, historical precedents, history, where the phenomenon allowed itself to be perceived as demonic. In which era literature, it's a book by, it's, it's a book, I'll call, quote a book out of Ariel Masters Library. It's called Eros and Evil. And in this book, this individual is detailing case by case these instances when witches in the Middle Ages were being taken by demons. And in these experiences, these demons would pluck them out of bed at night, take them on this, this, this ship or something. They, they really had no vocabulary for it, but they would take them on demonic flights. And so you, they, would, they wouldn't just take the wife out of bed, but in one text it said that they would replace her with a familiar spirit. And so a lot of us can't picture that because it doesn't make any sense. What is it? What would that even look like? Well, the purpose of employing a familiar spirit in place of the, the, the wife was so that when the husband wakes up in the middle of the night, he looks over and thinks that his wife is still in bed next to him. When secretly the phenomenon had taken her out and had captured her, they were called kidnappings. And in this book, Eros and Evil by R.E.L. Masters, he talks about numerous case studies where these witches believed they were copulating. You guys know what I mean. You, you know what I mean. Copulating with demons and corpses. And so they get to their witches' sabbat. They perform their rituals. They light their candles. And so... There is this kind of weird sociological scenario present. The demon manifests or the corpse walks up. And for the next two hours, they, they perform all kinds of incantations, all kinds of rites. But the experiencer, the, the witch, is really believing the entire scenario is authentic. These are demons. These are corpses. And this is real. In Ariel Masters' details, is fascinating. He, he opens up with that. that. That was the canvas upon which he draws this picture. He states that the phenomenon failed. This is even demonology. This is why you get in trouble with people. Okay, they're all demons. Wait, right? Hold on a minute. Let's back up and ask ourselves some questions. The phenomenon failed. It was almost like a technology was being was present, being employed, and it, had, it created an entire theatrical production 
around the belief and the expectation of the experience. And what happened was these witches are, are doing all, all, everything they're doing, performing their rituals. And, and in one fleeting moment, it went from demon, corpse, boom. And they realized they weren't on the back of a mountain. They were in a room. And that was at a corpse. That was a metallic object that was created in the image, or shall I say, in the image of the measure of a man. I'll just kind of skirt around that. And what they realize, this is, this is not a demon at all. This is some form of an intelligence that was employing technology. In, in, and like I said, evolving according to the belief system and according to their expectation. And that is when they saw that some of these objects were circumcised. And, and when I read that, that's when I saw it. It was catering to the belief system. And the reason it was doing that is because it was masking itself, hiding from these experiences. This is why when I do lectures, I do question and answers or Q&As after the lecture. There's a lot of people that want to pin me down. Okay, they're demons. And so their worldview is demons or aliens, demons or aliens. And we have to sit there for 25 minutes and have to unpack it. But my theory, the hypothesis that my colleagues and I are, are centering ourselves around now is that there is an intelligence that is neither. And the reason, again, it's, it's, it's hiding from us. And there have been people that have seen past the mask that the phenomenon is actually targeted. Targeted. I've had that myself. I was doing a lecture on symbology and skin anomalies in both possession cases and in UFO abduction accounts. I received two different emails from experiencers, two hours apart. One of which said, both of them actually, it was word for word, our guides want you to know that they'll be waiting for you when you die. So what I'm saying here, what I'm suggesting really, is that whatever we're, whatever we're dealing with, has not only evolved according to our awareness of it, but it, it is in such control of our perceptions of it. If, if, if we zig, it'll zag. And in many cases, this is really interesting too, to, to me it is, we have case studies through history where you see the mask begins to change. When they abduct people, it changes. It's not horns and hooves anymore. And it's not deer and Edna anymore. It evolves. But along with that, that moment of evolution, it will also reincorporate certain agendas back into that new incarnation. That, my friend, is when researchers like myself and others have said, wait a minute, that's it. That's the phenomenon. It's doing what it wants to, but it does not want to be seen for what it is. So... The hybridization program, for instance, when we're getting into the data here in case studies, one of the very first manuscripts I read about a fetus being created by the phenomenon was in the Apocryphon of John. It was a Coptic manuscript preserved and written by Egyptian monks. And it, it, it introduced a very unique pathology. It, and this pathology, thankfully, well, I shouldn't say thankfully, but uh, we were fortunate, researchers like myself were fortunate enough to pick it out and say, okay, out of all the incarnations we've witnessed throughout history, this is something that has been consistent over and over again. So in the Apocryphon of John, it talks about case studies where women would go to bed and it, it didn't always happen in bed. It didn't always happen at night, but a lot of times it did. They would go to bed at night and they would just be sleeping or they would be groggy or even sometimes awake and a being would manifest to them. And here is the pathology. It would manifest to them in the image of a lover or a husband or someone they had already been with. And so the phenomenon was like inducing them into this like role-playing scenario. Do you believe I am who I appear to you as? In, in this encounter, the woman makes a decision. No or yes. Do I believe you are my husband? 
after. And so most of the time they did. Yeah, you are my husband. And so they would get in a physical relationship. They would copulate. And here is the alarming behavioral pattern. At the moment of conception, they would reverse their appearance and then stare into the eyes of the victim and then inseminate them with a fetus. Very peculiar, very peculiar. Now, in these texts, it's a very, it's an interesting theory and one that I'm buying into. The idea in this pathology was obviously it was not the husband. It was a mask. It was trying to garner a form of consent. You know, go along with me, whatever. But at the moment of insemination, it changed into its real image. Why? Good question. Why? Thank you for asking. I'm kidding. Uh, the reason is, and demonologists in history recorded this, in antiquity, they had an idea. It was called an obstetric tradition. Their concept of fertility and pregnancy, it was centered around the image of the man the woman was intimate with. It's a game changer. They believed that whatever image the man possessed, she would create the material image of in her womb. And so what you have here is the father looks identical to the biological avatar that is the fetus. And so histor historicity teaches that it's very strange, but the idea was that this was an apparition, but it wanted a body that looked like the apparition. And so in a sense, you have the hybrid. And I'll back up and say it again, where you have the software in the hardware. So that was one behavioral pattern that kind of exploded everything in, the, in my research. It's like, wait a minute, uh, that's, that's exactly what we've seen in incubi cases over and over and over again. What is the purpose? What is the, so in this model that I'm talking about right now, you have possession. That's the consciousness. You have pregnancy. That's the hybrid. What our ancestors were teaching us about was a species of spirit, in a sense, an entity, if you will, a disembodiment, if you will. And in these texts, they started to, to really manifest victimology even. Very interesting. In other words, they would, they would stalk and monitor fertility. And in many cases, they would, they would not stop with that. Okay? Like for instance, in the 16th century, there were cases in Safi Israel, it's a province in Israel, where women were going to bed at nighttime, once again, and they were being induced into dreamlike states, same pathology, same, same everything. And in this dreamlike state, they are confronted by an entity. Sometimes it would appear as the husband. Other times it would appear as a boyfriend they were intimate with in the past. But it would confront them in the dream and it would assault them if it had to. If not, easier for the entity. But in many cases, it would assault them in the nightmare. And these women were waking up the next day, getting for work, getting ready for work rather, going to work, and they're going about their day when they realize there are bruises on my wrists. Where did that come from? This will freak you out. And they look at their ankles and, wait a minute, why do I have ligature marks on my ankles? And so they're, they're dealing with PTSD and, and just immense, immense emotional scarring because they're, like, what is going on here? That was just a dream, right? It wasn't. Those were memories. Those were memories. And so, so you see the evolution of the phenomenon, you see the bloody footprints in the snow, and you, you realize, like they did, it may have been a dream state, but it actually happened to them. Many of these women became pregnant. 
from that encounter. I haven't even went into the UFO abduction phenomenon, my friend. This is, this, I'm going to tell you something here in a bit that's going to freak you out and kind of put some pieces together, hopefully. So these women are going, going back to work, going home, living their lives like they do, like they always have, trying to ignore the fact that there are physical bite marks or scarifications, uh, skin anomalies on their body that correlates directly with the nightmare they had the night before. It's very difficult for them. I, I remember reading some diaries uh, that were preserved by uh, some human, it was crazy. It was really sad, it would break your heart. These women, they, they, they were beginning to get pregnant by these beings. This is when you get into the incubi lore. And in these pregnancies, it was not just pregnancy. They began to have memories that did not belong to them. When you see it, you're going to see it and you're going to be like, oh my God, Nathaniel. Memories that did not belong to them and urges, uh, tastes, their, their, their tastes in culinary cuisines changed. They, one lady said she, she remembered this is in South Israel. She remembered eating beignets in Paris, France, but she'd never been to Paris, France. And, and they began to demonstrate characteristics of what we know as possession. Now, at this point in history, there are cases coming out over and over again. It was like a, a hot spot, if you will, a flap, like a UFO flap, but with incubi cases. And so there was an influx of, of female victims, many cases, the same scarifications, literally the same story, the same nightmare. Uh, sometimes it was the same entity, like the little, not, not just the same entity, but the same mask, the same manifestation, the same person that manifested to them in the nightmare. And so this is incredible. They would go to their local exorcist and... By the time it got to about two or three cases of what I'm about to share with you, they began, these exorcists began to call for physicians from out of town. You got to get over here. We're experiencing something that we do not understand. It does not fit into our blueprint. It's very strange. It's paranormal. And we, we need somebody to document it. And so they would, they, these exorcists would call in physicians and historians and researchers. Here's why. These women were not only possessed by the entity, but they had become impregnated by the entity. And so when they're confronting this being that is inside of these women, the being's arrogant. It's telling them, oh yeah, my name is this, my name's that, and giving all these various explanations until one woman walks up to them, possessed, same exact story all of the other experiencers have, this one's different. This one's different because she is possessed. There are scarifications on her body, but she's pregnant as well. They perform what is called the Lavouche method. They put their thumbs on the wrist and they felt two heartbeats in the same body, two pulses in the same body. And as they're documenting this case, they ask the most profound question in all of demonology, in all of demonology. And here it is. Is she pregnant by the entity? Or is she pregnant with it? And when they performed the exorcism, uh, I'm telling you, it's getting dark. It's dark, dark, dark. The phenomenon took the consciousness, but it also took the fetus. May I present to you, my friend, the real missing fetus syndrome. That's it. This is why we can no longer compartmentalize the phenomenon. That was, had nothing to do with ufology, but what it had everything to do with a species, like I told you about the Apocryphon of John, 
who is trying to self-replicate through the mortal portal of women and wombs. This is this by nature. Okay, let me back up to this. This is why anyone who studies the UFO abduction phenomenon, they desperately need a background or at least a foundational knowledge of incubi encounters and of the phenomenon as it's been recorded itself. You've got to be Joshua Cutchin, okay? <laughs> You've got to have that kind of archival mind to where you can piece together not the mask, not its newest incarnation, but what it has been doing and what it will do when we're all dead and gone. That is the, the contextuality. That is the background, really, of the modern missing fetus syndrome. The only difference is these other, a lot of these other researchers who, who are, they don't know about that phenomenon. They, they never read the book or they don't, do not know these case studies. They'll go out there and say, of course, it's alien. It's always alien. It's always alien. Not realizing, hey, listen, those weren't aliens. That was an entity. That was an intelligence that was trying to self-replicate through women to take the body. Now, here is something explosive. This this will start, you, yeah, right? You'll start to really put it together. In esotericism, in necromancy, specifically, it's called the red rite. When a magician or a high sorcerer was, was getting to the end of his life, his body is dying, he wants to survive post-mortem. But he needs my new social skin. What he would do is he would go and inseminate a woman. Check. Wait a minute. What? He would create a fetus in the womb. What? Check. And then he would impregnate his consciousness in the fetus. And now it has a new body. And there is a theory that what we are witnessing is not just the self-replication of a species, but there is a connection to what I've called necronetics, the genetics of necromancy, where it is a strain of consciousness. It's intelligence, obviously, yeah. It can count, <laughs> but it, more than that, it is a strain of consciousness that will implant, we'll get to that in a second, and impregnate and those two arms are primarily the way it has self-existed throughout history. And what we can, because I've already covered the missing fetus syndrome, and, and hopefully people put, put that together with ufology and everything. So, I, yeah. But those are the two factions. Those are the two ways, the implant and to impregnate. That's how it exists. So, the... the it's so interesting because like this whole umbrella it's like you have like the esoterics i don't want to say religion because that's such an ambiguous yeah. term but like the esoteric spiritual side which is like mm. based on what this entire conversation has been and then the i yeah. saw a dog man and like just cryptic, oh yeah right and yeah. it's like they coexist beautifully but it always seems like it's like you're either like what we're talking about or like what we're talking about and Correct. it's refreshing to kind of like get into the more like the the deeper aspects mm -hmm. of this topic and not just like oh well, i saw bigfoot and this is what i think it is and oh my god yeah i yeah. collected some <laughs> samples i got me some yeah. poop yeah it's a little bit different um it, and it, it, it is disturbing especially once we get into not what these are but because we don't really know what they are but we know they're modus operandi we've documented that and in many cases a lot of them uh, they do employ rituals and uh, build me an altar and I'll respond. That right now, because I'm, I'm giving a lecture in England in a, in a couple months, and that's going to be the topic of discussion. What are the occultic connections to these beings? Because when these women were, were, were encountering them, they did have their own pathologies. Matter of fact, Father Sinestro of Amino was a Franciscan priest, and uh, he had one case study, at, le at least one, where he was working with a woman and a family, husband and wife, 
And they were at their wit's end. We cannot stop this entity. It appears as me. So my wife thinks that she's, you know, with me at the time and I'm at work and the wife couldn't get rid of it. And so they, they called upon Father Sinistrai. Well, Father Sinistrai is working with the family. And so one night he gets word that the entity was at the house. And so so he's running. This is in the 16th. He's running. The, this is in the 16th century, but he's running to the, the cottage and everything. And finally, when he gets there, the family is just inconsolable. Like, and the wife is in the room, doesn't know what to do. She just got assaulted. There's blood on her. You know, she's just scarification, all that. Then he looks on, on the bed. And there are semen samples that the entity had collected from a man, God, and used it to try to inseminate her with. And they weren't normal. Matter of fact, they were green, purple, and black. But it was during this time in history when these entities were witnessed hovering over graveyards, specifically over recently deceased men. And both Sinistrari and another guy named, another researcher named Montague Summers independently came to the same conclusion. And that conclusion was that the very first samples that the, the phenomenon was using to inseminate women with, they came from corpses. And in Father Sinistrari's book, he said they were milking the carcasses of the dead. Now, the model I have just presented that is the foundation of the modern hybridization program. This is why I have such anxiety when, because I've worked with victims of this, where people go out, when people go out there and celebrate the fact, oh, I'm a hybrid mother, or I've got a thousand hybrid babies, and, you know, and, and it's such a great thing. The problem is, no, it's not, because... They're using these people to self-replicate. These children do not belong to us. They do not belong to these women. That is the social skin from which this consciousness will implant itself into. And I think that that is demonstrably troubling for me. It's not good. <laughs> One of the necromantic rites that was employed by idolaters When they, would, they would go out and they would dig up a corpse or sometimes they would go out and kill someone and then they would take a small piece of metal, yay big, there we go, carve the name of an unclean spirit in it, here we go, and implant that into the body. In the consciousness of that entity, you want to talk about memory metal and metamaterials? That is where it came from. And the consciousness of that unclean spirit would merge itself inside of that body. And so you would have eyes, but you would have unclean spirit vision, I should say. And we've, we've heard about this in ufology over and over again. Like they've actually told abductees, yeah, we're going to put this in you. We're going to look through your eyes. All of this stems, all of this stems from unclean spirits, my friend. A lot of our religious and spiritual conditioning comes from the fact that, like, the Western culture, and I'm, I'm, and I'm specifically talking about Protestant Christianity, is mm -hmm. it's definitely kind of, especially, like, in America, more like, it's, it's definitely the Westernized Protestant Christianity. Is it, It's become, like, a very good, like, feel-good Christianity. Right. And th there's not a lot of, like, talk about spiritual warfare or dealing with the spiritual side, even though right. if you're a believer— almost like everything you're living a spiritual life but it, it's just so weird and, I, and I'm, I'm saying this because there's a lot of people who are like oh you know i, I follow christ but yet they won't even entertain entertain the idea of, of cryptids or any, anything supernatural right. or to them it's just like oh yeah like it exists separate they're like oh yeah i had like a paranormal encounter when i was like five or like whatever and then it just doesn't even and it, or or like you were saying they have these uh horrific horrific demonic I don't want to say attacks, even though that would describe it, but um, episodes, because it, it, yeah. it's over like a series of time. Um, how many of them, I guess, are I would say are spiritually ill-equipped to handle that? It's like they have no idea. Oh, my God. Um, yeah. And I'm like, well, you know, what's fascinating to me, I'm a believer, and I mm -hmm. find that a lot of times, especially in, in what I, I would 
understand as alien abductions, right? Is right. that these beings, whatever they are, they seem to be, which is, it's funny because you mentioned this in the story about it, like having no authority over when you, when you <laughs> proclaim the blood of Jesus or use that as an authority, they, they, there's nothing they could do. And it does kind of ring it back to like, okay, like there, there is something going on. And this is actually leads me to my next bit. And actually, Josh Turner, so shout out to him. Uh, him and I, I think we're kind of like vaguely touching upon this. And, and he brought it up, but it makes sense. But I think. From the UK? Is, no, Josh Turner, uh, okay. Paranormal Roundtable. That there's okay. some, and of course, we, as humans, we're, 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 we're just these lowly little peon. We, we're stupid. We don't know. But <laughs> I, I th- there has to be some sort of spiritual laws governing right. the, the other plane that, that, and it corresponds with everything. It, it, it would correspond with what certain entities are allowed to do when they're allowed to do it, who they're allowed to affect, um, mm-hmm. how, when they're allowed to come to this plane, how long they could be here. I mean, it's, it's everything. Cause we were saying, well, how come this? And we don't know. We're obviously grasping at straws. Um, but I, as I was saying about the whole feel good Christianity thing, it's just, when I say the feel good, it's because if you think, if you choose to be a believer, you have to understand that there's, a, there's nothing, it's all spiritual. Like you have to, mm-hmm. You know, it even talks about the armor of God. Like, like that there, there's no just such thing as like all oh, being being a believer and then just living this life. So mm-hmm. it's so alien to me how the Western culture is so we become so deviated from anything spiritual, and mm-hmm. it's just yeah. like, huh? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it, it, this this actually segues back, and which I you are are a uh, man who who's studying a, studied a lot of like ancient Mesopotamia es- esotericism. So I'm sure you mm-hmm. know all about the Book of Enoch. Very. For those of you who, who who don't know what that is, I highly recommend reading because it talks a lot about. Yeah. I don't want to just say the origin of, of fallen angels, but but it talks honestly. Uh, probably one of the most mysterious subjects is pre-flood, because right. there's so little we know about the world pre-flood. And like like I know there's a lot of ancient texts that talk about things, um, mm. and obviously you know the Bible isn't about those other things it's about the gospel and and Mm -hmm. the fall and reclamation of israel so a lot of those other things honestly to god are irrelevant you know are biblically irrelevant and i think so too yeah yeah that there's a reason why the book of enoch is a part of the apocrypha um Mm -hmm. but with that said it does give a lot interesting sight of how like at the time they were teaching man all sorts of things technology warfare which i mean it's just like clearly there is all of them yes yeah and so that this is, I feel like, a very educated hypothesis that, you know, people say what was going on pre-flood. I think that if you were cast out, you know, if you're Lucifer, Lu- Lucifer, if you're Lucifer, Lucifer, Lucifer yeah. sounds like a, like an what? Avengers. <laughs> yeah, it's all like Lucifer. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. If, uh. if you want to defame God because you're jealous, what's the number one thing you do? Well, people say, "Oh, you got for his image, right? Right, but but deeper than that, what would you do? Yeah, I, I've always said that. Manipulate... It's like, wait a minute, yeah, yeah, you'd manipulate yeah. his DNA. That is the that is mm-hmm. the blueprint. And so, well, how would you do that? Hybrids? Where do you know? Like, right. I always wonder where where a lot of these Roman Greek depictions of creatures and chimeras come from. I I think there's a lot of stuff, and this goes into the Nephilim, which is such a mm-hmm. massive topic. There is a lot of right. things going on pre-flood that we'll never know that was wiped mm-hmm. out. Um, something that I always found interesting is in the book of Genesis, after Cain kills Abel, you know, God obviously marks him and, you know, he's like, now you got to go out to the wilderness, but the point of the mark is so, you know, other people, other people won't, will see what you did, but Mm -hmm. you have to stop and like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. Mm -hmm. What, what, What do you mean the others? Who else is here? Right. That's always been a polemic I've heard too. Yeah. And so it's like. Yeah, like what else is going? But again, that that's irrelevant. God just saying, look, you know, here's to here. Everything mm-hmm. else, it, it's is, is irrelevant to his master plan of, of being the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, so it's like, mm-hmm. I think that's why so many of us are like we want we want to know what else is going on. Uh, the Book of Revelations, man, I think is probably one of the most spiritual books in the Bible, and honestly, a lot of it is because. Unlike the other books, it's not chronological. Like there, the, it like there's parts that kind of talk about the past, like the letter to the churches. But then, mm-hmm. if as you kind of get, I, I'm sure you've studied Revelation and kind of looked in that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's like when you look over the Book of Revelation, th- there's chronological aspects to it, but there's also parts that like, 
correct me if I'm wrong, I'm a little rusty on Revelation, but I think like verses four, five, and six, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but th there's parts that, that are, are mentioned that it's going on during the entire course of it, while parts of it is explaining the chronological order of things to come. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's just fascinating. Right. To, yeah, it's just fascinating to me how you have such a, a spiritual book like that. That, could, that all the things that it talks about, they're like you know, they're like they mm -hmm. try to describe it like, oh well, it's this or I'm like, I, yeah. I, think that, I think there's more. You won't even begin to even even uh, comprehend it. And that's what he was doing. He, he lacks vocabulary for it. That's what's that's what's so powerful to me. Yeah, I don't even contextualize this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's like, and you can't, you, you know, think like when he wrote that, and like, and God showing him this stuff, like, what, what do you, how do you describe a nuclear cloud? Oh, it's like a palm You've tree. You've got to write it too, John. You've got to. Yeah, you know what I mean? yeah. And so it's like, how do you, or like, what? One of the things that always got me was that Jesus opens up the pit, and that the, these beings, which are described, come out and torment people for five months. What the heck is that? You know, and nobody Absolutely. can figure yeah, that out. No. Nobody can figure that out. So we're like, no, man, I, I don't know. It's eschatology is is difficult, and it's what fascinates me about it is you can have one scripture and a thousand different interpretations, different traditions. I remember back in the day, my dad would fly Hebrew scholars out from Israel. One guy would have one interpretation. Next year would have another teacher. What do you think? No, oh, that's not what it says. And he'd go into another interpretation. I was like, oh my god, so that's really what it is. Yeah, and th this is. Part of the problem I had uh, years back, I kind of like went, went like a, with, with like a falling out because I, I wouldn't say a falling out, but I'm like, I was just really confused about my faith at the time. And I'm like, I had a really hard time because like you have so many like Christian denominations who are like, well, you know, our denomination is the right way. And they all right. have like a tribe of scholars who are like 70, 80. They've been studying their whole life. Yeah, a bunch could, of like, PhDs. Yeah, they could, they could defend, you know, sword and shield their point and their biblical point of view based on their knowledge and the Greek and the Hebrew mm. and all of this. And it's like, okay, well, that, I, I kind of came to form. I'm like, well, how do I know which, which – and so, oh, like, of course, that was like, it's be frustrating. yeah, that, that was a point for me where I would just like call it spiritual maturity. But, um, but you know, they, you're right; they all have their traditions and they all have their sages too, and it doesn't really make any sense to me. It's like, what? Well, something I really wanted to touch upon is what you okay. something you said. Mm -hmm. So, I do subscribe to the idea that a lot of these entities are demons. For example, like like people talk about gray aliens. Oh, we're gonna get into that. Yeah, oh, you're, you're, you'll, you'll uh, like uh, it too. You'll love a it. A lot of those are. It's like the same thing as as demon, and especially like that. There's many stories in particular uh, where where people ha have proclaimed the blood or the name of Jesus, and these grays have vanished. So it's like, what what's that mm -hmm. about? What I'm about to mm -hmm. talk about is something that that's. I would say it's irked me, but it's like in that gray box where I'm like, I, I don't know. Yeah, you can't answer for it. It's kind of. Is that what you're saying? And that's what I'm going to pick your brain about. And what I'm about to say it isn't exclusive to this because mm -hmm. there's more of these, but like, for example, like Lemurians and all the other supposed alien races that are just like, oh, hi, like we're here to observe you humans. Like we don't really have an interest yeah. in like doing anything nefarious. We just are like, like obviously to me, like you hear about like reptilians, grays, that that's like really demonic, just evil. But then you yeah. have like these other beings, like uh, they're not called Nords. We're not playing Nordic, Skyrim Nordic. here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, but, no, you know, I was like, all right, whatever, it's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but that, like like the, these almost angelic beings, um, yeah. So it's like I know people are like what what do you make of that? I I don't know. A, a lot of us we just try to grasp yeah. at straws, you know. We don't know. But it, I wanted to pick your brain about that. What do you think about that? Like just pe what I would call yeah. peaceful entities. Well, in demonological literature, when demonologists were assisting a family they would often advise the family to not fall for what were called false divine or divine to divinity a false divine entity and it, it's a really weird phrase but the reason they boxed it up like that is because there were entities that would try to appear as divine you know, oh my God, I'm so powerful. I'm so holy. I'm the white lady. And it got to a certain point in, in uh, folklore and mythology that a lot of these people are like, okay, they started burying women in their wedding dresses. And so they believe this is a ghost because it was, must have been a woman buried in her wedding dress. But in order to understand and to order to answer your question, I would like to go out at a macro level 
and ask ourselves outside of the hybridization program, what are these beings trying to do and where do these beings manifest first? Was it NASA? It was in seance rooms. That is what they responded to first. Uh, even Albert Bender, who had created an altar in his attic, worshiping and giving them different offerings, hoping that they would step in and pity him. It's no different, no different. Uh, George Hunt Williamson, same thing. Build an altar. Come and, com come and commune with me. And sure enough, then they manifested the skull experiment. Let's all hold hands and try to contact the devil. And guess who manifested? These beings. So it gets to a certain point where, forget, it's a lot of people, you know, the depth of their research is, oh, well, there's an esoteric connection. We, yes, we know that. But let's go deeper for a second, shall we? The esoteric connection is not limited to them manifesting to psychics during seances. It's also manifested in the skin anomalies that they're carving, not onto skin, but through the skin to the surface. I had a case study years ago. I just talked to uh, the individual on a text before, before our show tonight. Nice guy. But I did a lecture on scarifications, um, different bodies, different experiencers. And he got a hold of me, and we get on the phone, and he tells me this story. He said that my father was a very renowned remote viewer. And he said, I grew up hearing stories about my dad and how he would go out of body. He would meet his quote unquote guides. He would give him answers to questions and different philosophies. And he would get, get back into his body, dial the phone number of a politician or a celebrity and say, hey, listen, I talked to my guy over here. AirPods suck, dude. They keep falling on my ears. I'm like talking, it's like hanging. I'm like, oh my God, dude. I feel like an idiot, man. Um, so he would, he would get back on the phone and be like, listen, you know, hey, Don, he's a politician. You know, you need to start polling in this area, not this area. Or you need to go after this population more, all that stuff. And sometimes it would work out. And when it started working out, he would charge him thousands and thousands of dollars. And he said there were often times where he's like, I'll be playing video games. And my dad would walk down the stairs, turn all the lights off, put the video game up, turn it off. Why? There's an entity in the living room. Really? Yes, he wants to communicate with you. He said, it freaked me out. He said, man, the hair on the back of my neck would stand up and everything. He said, but one night, something happened, and it, it altered, forever altered their future. He said, I was downstairs hanging out. Mom was at work. Dad was upstairs, out of body, doing one of his sessions with his guides. He said, next thing I know, my father is stumbling down the stairway. He's, he's, he's a white sheet. He's looked like he saw a ghost and he's inconsolable he's shaking he's crying he said i've never seen my dad cry before he said but something terrified him and he said i'm asking him what's going on you know are you all right <laughs> what happened and he said by the by the time my dad was able to console himself and articulate what he experienced he said next thing i know he has a massive heart attack he said, we get him to the hospital, we're taking his shirt off, and he said, the nurses witnessed this, my mom witnessed this, I witnessed this as a kid. He said, from underneath the skin, it's going to tell you exactly what we're dealing with here. Underneath the skin manifested subdermal scarifications. He said, we saw it moving itself to the surface. And then once it moved itself to the surface, it just looked like a regular scratch or a regular scarification. And I said, well, what were the scarifications? What were the scars? What did they consist of? He said, there were three religious amulets. What? I'm thinking, wait a minute. Uh, what? He said, yes, Nathaniel. He said, they had carved religious, hello, esotericism, through the skin to the surface. And I said, okay, do you have any photographic, photographic evidence? He said, absolutely. So he shared some pictures with me. One of them, in, in one of these instances, it was, it was a Jewish star, it was a star of David. 
And I was, I'm okay with that. I'm like, okay, that makes sense. Or I don't know, whatever. Sure. I understand that. I know what amulet that is at least. And he said, but then on the right side was the cross. And that's when I was like, that doesn't compute. Two entirely different religious traditions. Way different. And the third amulet, the third scarification, really grieved me. Because I didn't know what to do with it. He said the third uh, amulet was an arching Egyptian hieroglyphic. So I took that case study. And I tried to understand what kind of an intelligence would eclipse the microcosm of religiosity. Would, would tell a demonologist, yeah, 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 you go ahead and work with the cross. Or, or tell a rabbi, you go ahead and work with a Jewish star of David, right? Or, or tell an archaeologist, an Egypt, hey, yeah, go ahead and do that. That's, that's what we do. We compartmentalize it because that's where we're taught. And I understand that because I'm a PK, my dad's a pastor. Uh, what I'm suggesting is that whatever they're doing, it, they're playing by different rules here. And I think the reason they're playing by different rules is because they're playing a different game. And I am going to go in a very unique direction to kind of weave this back into the narrative I'm creating. Ufology has a nuance of sorcery along with it. What, what that young man witnessed manifesting through his father was sorcery. That was an entity that would do what mages did, who are performing high magic. They would carve amulets into objects. Some of them were offensive, some of them were defensive, some of them were female amulets, other were male. But the point I'm making is these beings were using esoteric symbolism with this individual. Fast forward to the 1950s and 60s a group in our federal government called the Collins Elite were researching the interconnectivities between esotericism, sorcery, and ufology. Because like my case studies and others, my colleagues, they were also talking to people who were encountering whatever this intelligence is. And instead of patting them on the back, and even more than that, instead of, you know, hybridizing with them, creating a fetus. No, what they were doing is they were carving amulets into their skin. Amulets, matter of fact, that could be traced back to Mesopotamia and back to biblical antiquity. And so this Colin, this group called the Collins Elite were going to experiencers house to house. They were financed by the government and they were performing experiments. This is going to blow your mind. And I'm going to lecture uh, at the Awakening Conference next year about this. One of their experiments was, was go, they went to the UK. They went to the UK and they collected soil samples from inside of an authentic crop circle. They talked to the witnesses. What did the, what did the ship look like? The, the craft? Oh, they, oh, it's a UFO. It's a documented UFO. So they knew, all right, we're going to go collect soil samples and see what we can discover if there are any cellular anomalies present and what's what's really going on with this and so the soil samples they collected indeed possessed anomalies on the cellular level there was in fact an energy signature in the sample itself then they went back collected grimoires took soil samples in the, with them, samples well with them in the experiment, they would they would pay individuals, and they would say, "Listen, do you mind if we curse you from this grim? Are you going to believe it? Do you? No, no, okay. Well, do you mind if we did? Oh man, It'll blow your mind. So they begin to perform incantations, created. And referenced, by the way, by the intelligence we're, we're talking about tonight. Right? And there were moments, like maybe, I think, there were some experiments failed, right? Like nothing at all. The phenomenon didn't manifest. 
But when it did, the EMF meters went off, they documented it, they could feel it. And afterwards, they took those soil samples. You know where I'm going, buddy. And they documented the same cellular anomaly. Matter of fact, it was the same energy signature that they discovered allegedly from that UFO in the crop circle. This is messed up, my man. And what they realized, and this is this is our government, what they realized. I got chills, bro. Right? Because you're seeing it. You're seeing it. And especially with you, you're like me. I have an evangelical background or something. You're starting to put it together. It's like, oh, my God. The, the incantations and the, I should say, the controls that they employed in these experiments, they weren't all curses and hexes. But the ones that weren't curses and hexes, they did not have the energy signature of the entity that manifests in the crop circle. What they realized was, oh my God, the only experiment that carried that cellular anomaly in the soil in that, that energy signature, the only experiments that did were experiments that were designed to physically and spiritually afflict individuals. The only one. Come on, come on, bud. Come on. Boom. High five. Come on, give it to me right now. High five. Go, one, two, three. Boom. Let's go. <laughs> Booyah. Checkmate. Checkmate. Interview's then done, they bro. said, <laughs> wait a minute. Kidding. Right, right, right. Interview there. <laughs> That's why. That's why. Now we go back to biblical antiquity. Oh, my God. Now we go back to biblical antiquity. And we go back to limitations when Moses is instructing the Israelites, you worship gods that are no gods. That's your false divine, my friend. Gods that were, it wasn't like just some, some, some uh, idolater just wakes up one day. Oh, I'm supposed to write these incantations? No. Who gave them these incantations? That's what I'm saying. It's the energy signature, my friend. It's them. This is, oh, you got me pumped up, dude. I believe that he was the greatest exorcist that's ever lived. And I'm not diminishing his role. Uh, I think that I'm still trying to understand the nature of oneness and if he was the son or the father. But let me, let me throw this at you, my friend. When you understand what they did at Genesis 6, right, social skins, if you look at what they were doing, it was taking the son and placing the father in him. And that's why, even in, even in demonic possession, uh, anyways, yeah, what we're witnessing is a form, it was actually an afterlife tradition from Egyptology that these entities were manifesting. In other words, they wanted a form of that which was invisible. And so now when you see that pathology manifested in ancient texts, especially in biblical antiquity, you see it, and you're like, wait a minute, okay, I'm following the behavioral pattern throughout history. Up until one day, oh my God, Yeshua HaMashiach, the footfall of the greatest exorcist that's ever lived, lands on a sandy beach in Galilee. And in the distance, there's an entity that is wearing a demoniac as a social skin, the image of the invisible. And then for the first time, you see the confrontation that we're going to face in the future. You're going to see, I got chills, man. You get me pumped, bro. So I love talking about this. You're going to see an entity that is inside of another body. What can combat that? Inside of mine. And that is exactly what they were teaching. It was very fascinating. It was like a direct confrontation. Are you the son of God? Yes. But if you've seen me, You've seen the father. You catch it now? It was it was literally the entity going, oh, this ain't my dimension, is it? Nope. I'm here now. And so I think it's very, it's deeper than than what, I'm not going to say you've been taught, because I don't know what you've been taught, and I don't know the amount of, but it's deeper than at least what I was taught. Who do men say that I am? Why was it important? 
Who do men believe that I am? Some, some say that are a problem. All that stuff, it's, it's, it's all about these beings thinking that they can hack the belief systems. Again, we got to look at the phenomena for what it's doing. It's looking, oh, oh my God, you're going to like this. You're going to like this. It's not just looking for practitioners. If you look at the way it's creating these experiencers and you see the way they respond, some of them respond to the phenomenon, you see the mutation of the intelligence and its true intention. For instance, how many times have you heard this? Well, my beings are benevolent. Well, how do I contact your beings? I'll contact them. I'll talk, I'll contact them. In a way, a lot of people who are secular will never understand this. In a way, it's not just creating practitioners out of experiencers. It's creating its own priesthood. Its own mediators. And this is this gets back into Paul saying, you know, if another Jesus comes to you, watch this. And I, I, I read that scripture for a thousand years. I didn't realize what he was saying until I, wait a minute. Other than the one you received, that means there's going to be two. Now, if you, if you really want to get deep, it's also a reference to the phenomenon we're discussing. Because in, in one way, it's symbolic, it's allegorical. But in another way, it's quite literal. It's a husband who's telling his wife, if an entity comes to you in my image, that's not me. Push it away. You're, you're like me. Like you and I are alike in the sense that like we're study bugs and I need to study more, yeah. but uh, you just had this hunger where it's like, okay, here we have this box of what we're told is biblical truth. Okay. But that doesn't answer all of our questions, right? It's all about no. the fallen reclamation of Israel. That's great. But like, what about all this other stuff that like, we don't have the answers to, to God that's yeah. irrelevant, right? That doesn't matter, but we yeah. want to know. So we have to start digging. It's like, oh, ancient Sumerian texts and all these apart. Like, okay, well, how does that connect? And so then you kind of know what you do. Where it's like, okay, well, um, what what I found very interesting too, and you do the same thing too, where you start you start digging. Sorry, I think my cat was trying to get in the door. Is you start digging on the other side. We're like, okay, I need to find correlations here. What I find very interesting, and again, me and Josh Turner had, a, I think, uh, had a bit of a conversation about this. If you talk mm -hmm. to like voodoo priests and voodoo practitioners, especially like down in, in the south, to them, uh, well, this is really to, to the occult world, blood is a currency. Yeah. It's a spiritual currency. It's part of the reason why, why human sacrifice has been going on since the dawn of time. I mean, look, back in the days, they used to, they used to sacrifice infants to Baal and right. – um, that that wasn't the only, of course, demon god. There are many, and there's always there always has been. But the, mm -hmm. the point is, is that it's interesting to me, and that this just for me, like, would reaffirm my belief is that they have to. It's almost like there's this um, counterfeit, right? Of course, like blood is a currency, Absolutely. which is interesting because it's like, well, Jesus, you know, we're taught, you know, gave his his ultimate sacrifice. So I'm like, why why is there that? Why is there that? They're counterfeit? playing by the same rules. They're they're yeah. playing. That is what blows my mind because let – me, let me put it to you this way. When we look at what the prophets were fighting against in the Old Testament, don't worship this. Right. Worship him. Even deeper than that, uh, there's a professor that, that I'm a good fan, big fan of. Her name is Professor Esther Amori. She wrote a book called – Women's divination in the Bible. I can't. Yeah, right here. Women's divination. She Union Theological Seminary is where she's from. Brilliant book, but she paints. It's a great. She tells. She, she weaves a narrative that maybe questions some things, but it really confirms some things as well. She said, "All right." She goes. There are certain things that Yahweh allowed you to do. There are certain ways that Yahweh allowed you to pray. Right. And it was almost like a father coaxing their child, don't go over there in the woods, go over here. And and these people really had no idea why. They're like, oh, I can't do that. No, you can't. Oh, well, you take those. I know it's something similar, but don't do it the way they want you to. Don't build an altar. Why? And I think, honestly, that they had their own conception of it. 
But I think right now what we're looking at in the 20, 21st century is now we're starting to see why he was outlawing these things. People like Albert Bender building an altar in his attic and then the beings manifest to him and terrify him. Right. Right? These are the same beings. And it was almost like through, through history, Yahweh was telling people like Parsons, Jack Parsons, don't do it, man. Don't do it. Why? Because you're going to open up a door you can't close. Yeah. And it they know that. Absolutely. Yeah. That's what it's shaping up to be, at least. Well, it, it's interesting you mentioned that. And so I'm actually going to bring up another point. Um, mm -hmm. I disagree with this, and mm -hmm. I'm going to mention why. So I've heard a lot of people, obviously, we all know about Ouija boards and how, you know, that right. they're, they're a gateway to communication. I know a, 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 one of the the bigger, I want to say, and it's not even a theory, but I guess everything is theoretical because nobody has the concrete answer. So we'll just call it a theory. Mm -hmm. uh, that is works. that Yeah. The Some lot, people uh, don't even have those, my friend. <laughs> Like a theory, what the what's up? I'm like, you don't even have a theory? Can you finish a sentence? No, I'm just kidding. Can you say anything? Yeah. Well, uh, I'm having a good time here. Me too, my man. Uh, 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 I guess a, a sect of belief is that, yeah. like, listen, Ouija boards aren't inherently bad. It's all about intent. I I, I get that, but at the same time, I'm like, okay, well, let, let, let's look at that. Let, let, let's let's say that is the intent. Well. Mm -hmm you're not going to use a Ouija board to talk to Jesus, right? So it's like, you got to think, okay, well, who, who, if, you, if you use a Ouija board, yeah. who, who are you going to talk to? Do like, oh, well, you know, these kind of spirits, I'm like, right, but but the idea, and again, this is coming from my, from my Christian background and Christian perspective here, is like, mm -hmm. whatever you're talking to is nothing of God. So whether you're pagan, right. Wiccan, like whatever your belief is, whatever, and you will be talking to spirits 100%. You are opening a portal yep. of, of spirits that are not from God to... to mm -hmm communicate with you whether physical manifestation or, or through so um and that's you know like one of the things i not ouija board specifically but but mm -hmm. god i think initially was like you know like don't do this stuff because you know like just be careful and mankind is like well it's it's a bunch of rules like, blah, blah. like i right. think when you look legalism, at legalism legalism yeah yeah i'm like okay but but there's we don't understand it's like for our own safety for for certain aspects now again people can disagree all they want like but that's fine that's just my belief but it's interesting when you look at that, you're like, okay, well, let's say it was for our, our spiritual protection. Like, how would it, right. and you kind of start thinking all the ways how it would protect you. Like, oh, yeah, it makes sense. Cause, dude, and, I, and this is it to everyone listening, doing what I do, you can imagine all this. And keep in mind, before I ever started this channel, I, I was obsessively reading up on encounter stories and just like things mm -hmm. of this nature, watching these shows for many, many years. So, this is all just like a culmination, right? Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, you hear just so many times that people use it and it always goes south. Never, I never read, read one thing where like these yeah. Ouija board and an angel, like angel Gabriel came or like mm -hmm. Jesus. It was, it's always bad. Always, always. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you one. And it's like, okay, clearly that they're there. And again, like, I'm not, again, we're not talking about the board per se, but we're, we're, we're talking because mm -hmm. people can, you can make a Ouija board out of paper. The, the idea is that you're create you're, creating something with an intent to communicate and open a door so I the agree. idea is it's like why like what what, what are you trying to achieve by opening this door because they see that they know they can you know and of course oh like God, you said, yeah. yep. they can like oh I'm, I'm your dead aunt sally you know or whatever oh let me to, let me throw to, this at you real quick you. yeah absolutely uh okay so there are two things i want to say now long before we had these movies about aliens and we had oh my god it's alien gray there was a guy named george hunt williamson who was using the ouija board to contact extraterrestrials mm -hmm. it, watch this again this in the phenomenon never corrected him whoa Think about how that, did he refer right? to it as extraterrestrials oh, god. oh he got a fancy okay. name like vaughn or something or whatever yeah Oh, it's an extraterrestrial. And, and even in that case study, you see. Oh, okay. Now, here's what. It, if I were to encapsulate what we're dealing with right now, even if it wasn't influenced, which it's not, at least my research is not influenced by, by the biblical perspective. This is just straight data. 
And that's what the, the crazy thing about it. And that sucks. I don't want it. You know what I mean? It would be different if it wasn't. But it's it's literally pointing right back to what we were told it was in antiquity. Um, when these beings in history, they, they would manifest uh, sometimes the children, some, anybody, everybody. But they would often employ the mask, like you said, of a deceased loved one. Now, the first mask I mentioned was the, a lover, right? The, 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 the incubi cases and the debut cases in history, a lover of some sort. There are entities that will manifest as a guide. But usually when that happens, they have to manifest as an authority figure. I'm a deceased ancestor. And so in times past, people would say, okay, you're my deceased ancestor. You know, should I go out on a date with Sarah? Oh, no, no, no. You need to break up with her. She's she's cheating on you. Cheating on you. Okay, okay. And so for a period of time, the mask was, was almost identical to what the real deceased ancestor would have been, right? Okay, yeah, you're a big Buckeye fan or, you know, whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. There, there comes a time when the mask is employed for the real reason it's present, and that is to get this person to make a decision or believe something they would have not, never otherwise done or believed outside of, hey, I want you to believe in me, right? You're my mom. Okay, I'll believe that. I'll do what you want me to do. And it's in that moment when my book is Skin That Crawls, I talk about how the phenomenon puts us in a scenario, and I call it a protocol of belief. It's not enough for it to manifest as dear Aunt Edna. It's going to lean on your belief in that image. Oh, my God. And upon that, it's going to break. It's going to do something that's antithetical to the known historical record of Daring Edna. In in many days, it's amazing, there have been times when people, wait a minute, caught it. Most of the time they don't. My grandmother would have never told me that. Would have never told me to do that. Why? Because, again, one was a mask. Now it's trying to gain control. And so in times past, we learned how to vet them, in a sense. Right? No, that doesn't compare. And, and it's like I said before, the phenomenon evolves according to our awareness of it. And so what I believe has happened is it realized that we are no longer believing in some of these masks because we can see through them. We can vet them. And my friend, they introduced a new character into the game of which we cannot vet. And that is the E.T. Well, yes, in the way, and here's how people are vetting the ET. I documented data, and I can prove to you that the ET was present. Now, we get into some really interesting stuff, because the manifestation is now validating the message. What's all this is getting interesting? Now what we're seeing is this, this, it is a deeply spiritual narrative where it's, it used to be, oh my God, I experienced this, an amazing entity. You probably heard this too, a lady in white or something. Oh my God, I'm in tears. This is the best thing that's ever happened to me. And then it mutates. And now what we're seeing is I got to build an altar. Hello, Travis Taylor. I'm going to go to New Mexico in the desert where Jack Parsons was, what are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to put an altar. So we've seen this in antiquity. We just didn't realize what we're seeing. I mean, we knew, okay, you shouldn't do this, you should do that. But we didn't realize the scope of the program. It starts with an experience of the false divine. Then it evolves into communication and maybe even copulation. And then it evolves into making prophets and priesthoods. And then it begins to teach doctrine. Matter of fact, one famous abductee now was told by a scientist, call him up one day. I have talked to them. We're going to move into the next phase. What's the next phase? You see, it's mutating. There's an end game. What's the end game? You are now to go into to, to churches and lay hands on people and heal them. I think the fact that the government does not want to disclose the nature of this phenomenon is quite telling. 
I think that the uh, information that the Collins elite gathered, their experiments, their case studies, that are, I think our government knows that. Matter of fact, the researchers I'm going to be lecturing with next month or in February, we're all on the same page here, guys. We, th they know, we know. We, we, we cannot, here's the problem. The reason, if they were to come out and say, yes, the phenomenon is a threat, that means that they're going to have billions of people. Can we stop them? That's the, I'm telling you, first question in my mind, how do we stop them? And the current position that they have is, it's, it, we can't. Now, moving right along, yes, I think, again, that these, my position, I should say, is that even the current model of demonology, they're demons. It's wrong. It's wrong. It is something that has stood in the corner, in the shadows, and has been manipulating us as a species for thousands and thousands of years. And the amount of control that it has over us is making even theologians uncomfortable. But, but even deeper, the, the phenomenon has a way of of managing perceptions and yeah so this is what i thought it looked like and it didn't look like that at all or or like like dr color turner had a case study where uh it's a woman she was working with uh, it was like a fourth of july party or something she had family over they're playing badminton horseshoes they got hot dogs on the grill and they're all just hanging out and suddenly over the top of the house cross street there comes this craft and everybody's looking at it well, she's telling Dr. Collar Turner this during a memory regression session. That's all I came in. And, uh, you know, <laughs> memory regression session. But uh, so she's like, listen, Dr. Collar Turner, like I, I, I remember vividly pulling out binoculars and looking at this craft for like 20 minutes. She said, matter of fact, I handed the binoculars to my best friend or husband. They used them to see the craft. She goes, more than that, I, I went. I remember going in my house, getting my telescope out of the box, and we're all looking at it with the telescope. She said, and, and that's why I'm scared. She said because when I woke up the next day, I realized I don't even own binoculars. And she said, and worse than that, the Amazon telescope that I purchased online was still in the box it was shipped in. So. Whatever we're dealing with, and this is what drove the Collins elite researchers, they were like, look, don't even contact these things. Like, don't, you know, don't open that door because what's going to come through, it will have, it's like a serial killer. It's like a serial killer, my friend. It, it doesn't care. It has its own morality or lack thereof, its own agenda, and it will manipulate any way it possibly can. That's why the prophets wept until their death. That's why they said, don't do it. If another Jesus comes to you, if another doctrine, and all that what we're witnessing now is the end game. And I'm afraid that as dark as we think it will be for people who don't believe in this stuff, there's going to come a time when even the church, the evangelical modernity, they're going to have to face the harsh reality of, yes, yeah, one thing to read a biblical text from thousands of years ago, have a three points to a conclusion, get an offering, sing a couple altar call songs and deuces. That's one thing. It's a completely different thing when you have people like Aleister Crowley, who, who are, they're very powerful, and they're here for, to, to have their own agenda. And I guess what I'm saying is that the phenomenon is going to put us in a place where it's, um, let the God who answers by fire. So my name is Nathaniel Gillis. My name is Nathaniel Gillis, and I'm a demonologist by discipline. For the last few years, many years now, I've been studying the malevolent aspect of the phenomenon, trying to pull back the thin veneer of love and light that it likes to manifest as. And uh, you can find me on Instagram and YouTube. I don't have a website. Too much to maintain for now. But now that I'm going to be lecturing across the, across the world, I'm going to have to get one. But you can contact me on social media. And um, I don't know if this will be recorded or not. Who cares? 
Man, it was nice to meet you, brother. Thank you so much for having me on. And admittedly, you know, I, I did, I mean, I knew some of the format, but I was like, oh my God, I've never, you know, had an interview with you before. So I was kind of nervous. Dude, you're awesome, brother. You're awesome too, Nathan. And that's about all the time we have for this episode. And because you guys made it this far into the episode, I want you to all comment down below, Nathan! So I know who made it to the very end and, well, who didn't. And if you guys want to see more interviews like this one, go ahead and smack that like and subscribe button for more. As always, I love you all. Keep an open mind. And I'll see you guys in the very next episode.